question. This question is from a non-Muslim. You were first a Christian, then yeah. a Buddhist for three years ago. Okay. What made you change your mind so radically from to be a Buddhist to a Muslim? What happened? Okay, it's very interesting. I was just talking to a gentleman about this issue of uh, Buddhism. Okay. The, the, my main problem with Buddhism was, my main problems are, number one, I don't agree with the premise of Buddha. The premise of Buddha is that life is suffering, okay? And in order to escape from, sorry, life is suffering, suffering is caused by the ego, the me, 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 yeah? So that's the problem. The problems, the suffering in life is caused by the ego. So therefore, the way to escape suffering is by annihilating the ego. That means, the word nirvana actually means annihilation. It means annihilation of yourself. You are no longer identifiable as a you. You are just. You are just. That's why I remember Yusuf talking about his journey to Islam had a similar experience and he went and asked a Buddhist what's the purpose of life and the Buddhist replied to him contemplating the supreme nothingness right Contem and really that's what it is because as the idea of Buddha is to annihilate yourself to self annihilation you no longer have the, the concept for a Westerner is so hard to even begin to comprehend. Yeah? So, the, the issue I have is number one. My first issue is this. There is suffering in life, but is life suffering? That's wrong from the beginning to say life is suffering. There is suffering in life, but there is joy in life. There is happiness in life. It's the same as the fallacious approach of the atheist. There is so much evil in the world, but the, yeah, there's almost so much good in the world as well, right? How come you only see the evil? How come you only see the suffering? So this is the first thing, the claim that there is suffering in life, as if that's all, no, there's suffering in life, and there is joy and bliss in life also. It used to be that people thought that Buddhism was very pessimistic. It talked all about suffering, suffering, suffering. And nowadays people are beginning to realize that no, the Buddha was actually talking about happiness. He talked about suffering because he wanted to, us to understand that there is suffering in life, but it is also possible to find happiness. In fact, the teachings are all aimed at happiness. But still, many times the interpretation of this is quite pessimistic. It was teaching that things change, that you simply have to accept the fact that things are impermanent, things are inconstant, things are going to be changing all the time. Once you learn how to accept that, be at ease with that, then you'll be happy. That's pretty miserable. It gives the impression that there's really nothing we can do, that there is no long-term happiness in life. There's no deeper happiness, there's no special happiness in life. That all we can do is just be very passive and just be okay with whatever comes up. Which is very pessimistic. The Buddha actually taught something much higher and much of much greater value, which is there is a happiness that we can attain through our efforts. Something that's special, something that's not dependent on conditions. And something that lies beyond just normal pleasures coming and going, but it lies deeper in the heart. Um, the idea that we simply have to accept that things come and go, I think comes from taking the Buddha's two teachings, what you might call the Buddha's two wisdom teachings, which are the three characteristics and the Four Noble Truths, and putting the three characteristics first, and putting the Four Noble Truths after that. In other words, saying that Okay, the, the Buddha says things are inconstant or impermanent, things are stressful, things are not self. In fact, sometimes this is defined as what right view is. When you accept these facts, and, the, and based on this interpretation, there are several conclusions that people come to. One is 
interpreting the teaching on non-self as a no-self teaching, which is that there really is no self there, there's no agent here, you're simply on the receiving end of things coming in depending on conditions. And you have no agency in changing things. That's one, one of the conclusions that's drawn. The second conclusion is that suffering comes from not being okay with change thinking that you have the power to change things and you're going to suffer if you think, okay, change is going to happen, just learn how to accept change and it'll be okay. That's the idea of what people are not suffering. Based on this is the idea of the clinging. That clinging means you don't realize that things are impermanent and so you hold on to them hoping that they will be permanent. But you're okay with the fact, if you are okay with the fact that things are going to change, then you're not really clinging, you're just kind of embracing lightly and then letting go. But if you ever notice the way people cling, they don't cling always with the idea that things are permanent. I mean, two of the big things we cling to in life are food and sex, right? Does anyone think food is permanent? No. Does anyone think sex is permanent? No. We all know that these things are impermanent, and yet we cling anyhow. And the reason we cling is not so much that we think that they're permanent, but we think that the effort that goes into clinging is worth it. The Buddha says we cling because of the pleasure we get out of things, and we think that the pleasure we gain from holding on is worth the effort that goes into the clinging. And human beings are really bad at calculating what's worth the effort and what's not worth the effort. <laughs> 